Okay, this is WCSB Cleveland. Uh, Damon, are you on the line? Yes, I'm here. Okay, cool. We have uh, Damon Packard on the line, filmmaker from Akron, Ohio, who's calling from L.A., right? Mm-hmm. Originally from Akron, yeah. Originally from Akron, and you've been in L.A. for a uh, long time, right? Yeah, since uh, 70, uh, well, since I was about five years old. Oh, okay. So you... about 73, something like that. But I go, I, I go back. I was just back there a couple weeks ago, actually, visiting for a week. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, visiting family. Yeah, I've met your brother, uh, Vince, at a, an Akron Film Festival before. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Yeah, it's cool. Yeah, I finally got to see him. I hadn't seen him in, in years, yeah. Okay, so you so you left you left when you were five, and you've been in L.A. ever since. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And my dad and my brothers followed uh, in the seventies, and they lived out here for years, and then they eventually went back a number of years ago. Uh, but I stayed. Okay, cool. And I see. On, I was just reading your Wikipedia. It said you lived in Hawaii for a while too. Yeah, yeah. I lived in Arizona and then Hawaii. Made a film in Hawaii, uh, a fantasy film called Apple. Um, I was out there in 91 and, uh, scouting locations. And then I went back there a year later, just with the, in, the intent of making that film, a little super eight film inspired by ElfQuest. And I was out there for almost three years, uh, part of the time living in a tent on the beach and, um, you know, saving up my money. And I brought out my equipment, super eight camera and a Steadicam junior, which was brand new at the time. And I was working at universal studios just prior to that, so a lot of the ideas, well, a lot of the ideas that went into reflections kind of came from that working at Universal, the ET adventure, because I was working at, at the ET adventure. Actually, what was your what was your when, job? When I was, brand new. I was uh, what was the job? Well, it was kind of like uh, it was like um, crowd. Uh, that's a good that's a good question. I don't know what the actual <laughs> position. You know, it was uh, working on the, the ET adventure. I was the ET adventure uh, um, attendant. Okay, keeping and, people in line. Would, yeah, they would circulate us to different. There were a, a lot of different departments. You know, there was the queue, the outside, and then there were there was a section where people would come in and and we'd issue them like an ET card where they go on the ride. Uh, it was like uh, that where ET said the the name of the person at the end of the ride. <laughs> and right. The yeah. actual pickup section where the 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 train would pick people up there was that uh it was kind of fun actually it was a, it was a, it was pretty uh, active um you know uh job to have you're running around a lot and and uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, it sounds it like fun thing. yeah i uh i just watched reflections of evil last night so um the uh, the director's cut so they uh, I, I remember the uh, the scene where Spielberg's giving out the cards in case you, you yeah. in case you have a heart attack or whatever on the ride right yeah, right it's very cool uh, well we'll get to reflections of evil in a moment was uh, was that when you filmed in Hawaii was Apple was that your first film no that was um, I don't know which I would be like third or fourth film I suppose uh, it's just in that Super Eight phase that was in from the eighties and nineties. Yeah, I, I was, you know, I was still like in the uh, the, the struggling years of, um, oh, it's still the struggling years. It hasn't yeah. changed at all. But, <laughs> but uh, it was just the, this period where it took, you know, in the film days when you, uh, you, you know, it was so expensive and, and um, to make movies. Uh, right. It just took a long time to, to, to scrounge up the money for film and uh, processing and equipment and everything else that went into it. And, uh, Anyone who's made films of that, you know, from that generation would would know. <laughs> right, it was a whole different. It was a whole different uh, situation. You were using mostly SuperCam, or sorry, sorry Super Eight and Steadicam. Well, uh, yeah, Super Eight mostly okay. uh, because it was the only affordable format to make movies. It was the only it was the only affordable way of making movies at all, really. Uh, and the Steadicam I, I got in 90, it was that had just come out, the Steadicam Junior, mm -hmm. for small cameras. It was built for camcorders. It was made for Super 8 cameras. And I think there was, there's a company here in Burbank called, formerly Super 8 Sound, they're now called Pro 8 Millimeter, and they modified that, the Steadicam Junior, I remember at the time, to work with one of their cameras. But it was built for camcorders at the time. But I, t I took it, uh, I just took it with me. I hadn't even opened the box, actually. I was out there for about a year. It was just fortunate that the camera was the right weight for the Steadicam, and then I, I couldn't see what I was shooting because the monitor was built for camcorders, so I just had to point the camera and, you know, just 
sort of uh, get an idea of what the right frame was and and uh, shoot it like that. But yeah, I was just I was just really lucky that camera was the right weight because I remember trying like three or four other cameras and nothing worked on that on that thing after. But um, but uh, yeah, that was that was quite an adventure shooting Apple. Yeah, and uh, before that, you shot a movie called Dawn of an Evil Millennium. Yeah, is yeah. that is that a horror uh, movie? I haven't seen that one. Well, uh, it's horror fantasy. Uh, it was um, it was like several things sort of mashed together. It, it started off as a chase film. It was really a, a kind of an homage to Blade Runner. It was my Blade Runner and Mad Max sort of George Miller Mad Max um, combined and. Uh, or sci-fi fantasy, uh, and it, it, it's kind of hard to explain because it, it started off as, some, as just a chase film, then I expanded it and I turned it into a twenty-minute trailer. Okay, which is, yeah. which is a <laughs> good length for a trailer, I think. That's, yeah, cool. And um, let's see. After after you made Dawn of an Evil Millennium, were you in, were you in film school at any point making those? I was in in eighty eight eighty. 87, 88, went to LACC film school for, I don't know, about a year or so, and that was mainly just to, to borrow equipment and meet people um, that had been making films for some years prior to that, and, and I always, you know, I had dreams of going to UCLA film school, right. um, and used to hang out on the campus a lot and, and um, help out on, on productions in the early 80s, and I would borrow um, equipment from them and, and like lift gels and things like that from productions and use them on my own films and uh, yeah I but, think, uh, I think yeah. that's the best so, best thing to do in film school is just sign up for a semester and use as much equipment <laughs> steal right, as much equipment exactly. as you can right exactly and it and it uh, yeah it, it served its purpose I mean I did uh, I did borrow some equipment for, for a while and met some people who helped out on, on production in fact Dawn of an Evil Millennium came about through it was really kind of started with an LACC. That actually started as an LACC film project. Now that I think about it, um, because the, the yeah the chase film I made for film class, I, I guess it was just sort of an excuse to to you know get some motivation to make another film. So that that grew out of that. What is what is Elf, Elf Quest? I'm I'm curious. I didn't. You said it's an Elf Quest inspired film, Apple, but I, I'm not sure what Elf Quest is. Elf Quest is a graphic novel that. Started in the seventies from these two artists, Wendy and Richard Pinyi. And uh, if you've ever seen the Ralph Bakshi film Wizards, it's very inspired from Elfquest. I think Elfquest, or yeah, Wizards is inspired. I think Elfquest came first. Um, and uh, it's you know it's a com it's a graphic novel comic book series, and I just I just love the the artwork and that the the world that they created. Um, I don't know why I was so interested in making an an elf fantasy film I, it's it's hard to describe what that you know how that came about i was just fascinated you know at that time i mean it had only been 10 years or less that had passed since the early 80s and the early 80s was like the fantasy boom right in cinema there were, and um somehow i was enamored by that and i i wanted to you know, make uh, like a lost uh, early '80s fantasy film. Did you do anything with puppets with or puppets in that? Like, uh... yeah, okay, yeah. There are some some puppets in it. Yeah, cool. Uh, there's a little furry creature in it that pops out of bushes and uh, yeah, off the shelf puppets. Yeah, then I've, I've, I've used puppets in other films, a little more elaborate use of puppets and in recent. Uh, Fox Fur had some some puppetry. Uh, did you watch Fox Fur? My uh, Last uh, night, last night I watched the director's cut of uh, Reflections of Evil. I watched the when he sent me the new one, John Carpenter's Corpse, and I didn't really, uh, yeah. I didn't really have time to watch Fox Fur. I'm sorry. It's just uh, your stuff's so overwhelming. It takes a lot for me to process, you know, uh, reflections yeah. and <laughs> every time I watch that. So, so I haven't seen Fox Fur yet. I had some nice Jim Henson like puppets in Fox Fur. And prior to that, I uh, had some puppets, and I, I made this Japanese fantasy film inspired by Miyazaki's um, Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind, and had some, some puppets in that that were um, done by a, a girl who works for the Bob Baker Marionette Theater. She was doing a lot of puppets in, in my films. Um, so, yeah, I love using puppets. 
yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan of puppets in films. I don't think there's enough, especially when they're, they're interact- when they're interacting with humans. You know, I like I like that. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, and you know, if you're working on a no budget scale, it is extremely difficult to find good puppets, really, uh, you know, professional Henson level puppets. Yeah. Uh, you know, if you're just sort of like throwing ads out there and looking for people who will work for you know a hundred dollars a day or fifty, you, you, you just it's you really have to get lucky with that because uh, there's not there's not a lot of people out there um, with uh, you know with those, with those kind of skills or with that kind of stuff laying around. Um, so yeah, it's difficult. So you, your early films, did you edit them all yourself, uh, cutting cutting on film and stuff? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. For 20 years, yeah. Shooting on film, splicing, splicing film, uh, you know, working with viewers, editors, sometimes without a viewer, just looking at the, the Super 8 film and, and cutting by eye, frame what? by frame. Would you but do yeah, those, um, like, mashups before? I mean, like, the uh, the footage, you'd take footage from 70s films no. and intersplice that. Was that all after after the introduction of computers and, you know, digital, yeah. digital editing? Yeah, that came okay. in the, yeah, early 20th century, the beginning of the Final Cut Pro era, yeah. Yeah, the mashup phase, right? Um, the Star Wars mockumentary and things like that. Yeah, because it's really—I don't know—I'm I'm a big fan of your editing, like reflections of evil and skate bang and stuff like that. The the layers of different things, uh-huh. you know, where you don't know—did he shoot that or did that come from a '70s movie? And the the constant um, changing of cameras and filters, like I'm, I, you yeah. know, it throws you off. I'm not sure. Did is that you know something he films? I, I really, I'm a really big fan of that style of editing that you. I think kind of. I only use. Yeah, I mean, it's much more interesting to do original, you know. Than I, I don't really. I'm not a fan of mashups, and I don't. I've used it in my own stuff, really, to just just to fill in gaps that were needed for whatever it was I was doing. Uh, um, if there was no money, it was just it was just sort of filling in gaps that were needed there. Um, you know, I'm trying to think of, of some examples. Like uh, the, I don't know if you watch Space Disco. Space Disco One, the opening title sequence in that, for example, I, it's, it's like really long. Is that Roller Boogie? Like Roller Boogie, and then there's like well, some Exorcist one. going out of the. Okay, okay. That 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 was a whole separate deal. That was a that was a like a client. <laughs> yeah, that was something else. That was a client. Okay, I've seen there. I've seen that one where there's Roller Boogie and like Exorcist shots. See, Super that Bo- was yeah. um, Roller Boogie Three was someone gave me a, an unfinished like roller um uh roller disco movie that a friend of theirs made um a friend of mine tony um and which was kind of funny in itself and so i took that and combined it with other things and remixed it and and that came about with that um and um and that was actually a paid project didn't pay much but you know so it was a it was a fun experiment for the time it seems like those are the ones that you get paid for is these uh these like uh editing like um trailers or skate videos or different people's projects those are those are like your your paying gigs i guess some of them yeah i mean most of them the paid stuff usually doesn't pay much yeah uh but um yeah it varies it, it, it's 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 uh yeah i mean ninety nine percent of the, the you know the paid work i get uh just you know barely pays anything but um some of it was fun to do. Some of it it did uh, because I was, uh, you know, like in the early 2000s when I was learning the software and I was still, you know, uh, there's there was a lot of experimentation. It was um, there was that, you know, I was doing a lot of it just for the the uh, the learning process and having fun with it. Well, uh, for, um, w- watching Reflections of Evil the first time I saw it, like uh, six years ago, I-, I had never seen a movie like edited that way, or you know, with with all the layers, the, the sound layer, the sound editing is amazing in that film, and the layers of fil- uh, film and the stolen footage. I just thought it was like revolutionary, you know, like uh, ta- you know, ta- taking whatever you want and j- just like the balls to do that to to take footage from other movies mm-hmm. and then put your own stuff. And I, I don't know, I'm-, I'm a big fan of the the way that film was edited. Yeah, you know, I kind of, I mean, I look at it now, and it's it's a little, you know, it's a little, it's pretty rough around the edges. I it's, I could have done a, a much better job on the mix and the and the, uh, the just the, you know, there was never really uh, there was never really a final definitive cut that I was completely happy with. The the first cut was too long. The second cut, first cut was 136 minutes. The second cut, I think, was 118 something like that, and that was kind of rushed together for a screening. And then there was a third cut. 
for a uh, release. There was actually an official release of it, got on Netflix and on the stores, and that right. sort of disappeared. Uh, and, and that's too short. Yeah, I originally saw. A lot of things. I originally saw the um, and the one I watched last night again too. Uh, the uh, I guess it's two hours and eighteen minutes according to the VCR. I have that one on oh, VHS. Oh, that's the long one. Yeah, that's yeah, that, the one I'm. I'm. Uh, you know, I'm not. That's probably the one I'm. I'm probably the most embarrassed by. It's 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 pretty rough around the edges and I, it's hard to get through. And, and I, of the two cuts I've seen, I like that one the best. I mean, scenes are very excessive. They go on for a very long time, but I, I like the excessiveness of it. You know, 10-minute refrigerator <laughs> scene, of just you know, right. where it's no, normally somebody would look at something disgusting in the fridge and then like, ugh, and then like the scene's over, but you just keep it going for like 10 minutes with all these yeah. all yeah. these things. And I, 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 I enjoy the exce- It is tough for some people, I guess, but I enjoy the excessiveness of it, and I enjoy all the stolen, stolen footage. I saw that one originally, and then I couldn't find it for years. I got the one, I, I went to Video Spectrum in Bowling Green, and they actually had reflections of evil the one that's widely available the shorter cut without the uh, without the stolen oh. footage they had that one uh-huh. at video spectrum in bowling green and i like i burned a copy and that's the one I, I so i've seen those two cuts and i've watched that one many times but i was like ah, oh, this is missing a lot of stuff this is uh this is missing schindler's list the ride you know now it's kinski's list and uh yeah. <laughs> right the et footage a lot of the stuff that you could a lot of the music the carpenter's music i guess that you could have gotten sued for um is missing from that one <laughs> Well, you know, yeah, but that version still has a lot of um, uh, cues and tracks in it that are. You know, they, they, I just replaced them with more obscure. I mean, there's there's uh, there's some contemporary classical in it. There's like with like Ligeti and Penderecki and Henze and things like that, mm-hmm. which is which technically all that is unlicensed because it's it's, they're, it's copyrighted by the recordings. And then uh, there's music uh, by a, a composer named Franco Michelizzi from uh, The Visitor. Which is very popular now. So at the time, um, the film's kind of gone through a revival over recent years. So, um, yeah, and there, there's more obscure, more Coney tracks in it in, in some scenes. Yeah. Um, so it's a mishmash. There were there's so many. There were so many cues I needed for that film. That was that was pretty. Yeah, it was a pretty uh, impossible task. Uh, um, just to do with like you know unlicensed library music. I would never I never would have found library music that I was happy with for that. Right, it's probably but, the re- it's probably the reason that movie hasn't been seen so much is because of all the uh, the stolen stuff. I- I'm guessing because I think it should be playing at midnight movies instead of like the room or something. Reflections of Evil ought to be playing in theaters. Yeah, uh, yeah. well, I mean, you know, and the distributor that put it out. I mean, they, um, I I don't know. They, I mean, I I am absolutely convinced they could have put it out as it was. With all the the tracks and the cues the way they were, nobody would have cared or complained. Um, I mean, it's so under the radar, and and uh, it would have never made any money one way or the other. Uh, uh, you know, it just nobody would have cared. I mean, I mean, someone just got a wide, you know, a pretty big release on that Disneyland movie, uh, and they did, the, and they snuck back. You know, uh, Escape from Escape movie, from Tomorrow. Escape from Tomorrow, right? I watched that, and I was wondering if that was inspired by Reflections of Evil, because you did the Universal Studios stuff. You know, I, I guess you were... Yeah, I haven't seen it yet. I, I, I can't really uh, comment on it. I haven't, I haven't watched it yet. Um, I've heard it's not very good, but... Uh, it, it's haven't, interesting. Haven't it I, I saw it, and I saw it, it got released theatrically here in Cleveland. I, I, I saw it in the theaters, and my, uh-huh. fr- my friend had told me, my friend had come back from the Sundance Film Festival, and she had watched, I'd screened um, Reflections of Evil, and she's like, I saw this movie really similar, you know, and, and that, that, you know, they filmed on, on Disneyland without their permission, I guess, and I mean, that, that whole movie is yeah. in, in Disneyland, and you just have, you know, certain sequences at Universal Studios, but I'm, I'm wondering, I guess we'll go back, uh, the, the or- Magic Mountain, too. yeah, the Magic Mountain, the origins of that, because it seemed like some of that stuff was filmed in 94, 95, based on, I saw an Apollo 13 backdrop, and Waterworld, the ride. This is all stuff that came out around '95. So, did Reflections start all the way back in the oh, mid '90s? No, uh, no, that was actually 2001. Okay. Um, yeah, that was all. Two, that was pre 9 11. I mean, it was, and actually during 9 11 because I incorporated some of that in in the uh, you know towards the end of shooting. Uh, but it was all. I, mean, I started shooting, I think, around December of 2000. But uh, yeah, it was all 2001. Space Odyssey. <laughs> right, right. Uh, I can't remember. Well, you, know, you can see if you're paying attention to the bill. I mean, the Ms. Congeniality billboards at the oh, beginning. Oh, yeah. Uh, whatever. Things like that. Yeah, uh, Disturb that the Sickness. The yeah. yeah. The Waterworld is a, is a that's a, um, a permanent um, attraction at, at, at Universal Studios. It's still there now? Um, it's, it's still there. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. 
that opened, I don't know when that opened, in the late 90s, I think. And, but, yeah, it's, it's a permanent attraction there. I don't remember what the Apollo 13 stand-up was for. I <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, seeing all those in the background, but, uh, I, I just thought, I mean, he filmed this. He filmed these parts in 95, and then he ca- he came back six years later and filmed the rest of the movie or something. That's what I was thinking yeah, at no, the time. No, it was all, uh, it was actually shot over a pretty short amount of time, really. And, and, and I was taking my time with the uh, with the production of it. But, um, you yeah, it was all 2001, over... You know, a pretty short amount of time. I think the summer, around the summer. Okay, yeah, I I, I had a film much longer, but you you had you had a budget for that one, right? What was the that was your your, yeah. your film with the highest budget? What what was oh, yeah, the, yeah. what was the budget on Reflections of Evil? Probably, you know, uh, it, it. I wasn't keeping track. I mean, I guesstimated around a hundred grand, but half of that was just, or more than half, was just the cost of. Film, telecine processing, transfer, conversion, all the the expenses of shooting a sixteen millimeter feature. Is that uh, all, is it also really expensive? Is most the bulk of it sixteen millimeters? There's some shots that seem digital. A lot of it that seems like yeah. film. No, some super eight, maybe. It's, it's, I'd say it's about eighty percent sixteen. There's oh, uh, you know, fifteen percent super eight. There's mm-hmm. definitely there's a lot of different. Uh, Types of Super 8 in it too. I was using reversal, the 35 stocks that they they have at Pro 8 millimeter, and I was using the last like batch of Kodachrome 40, um, and I was using some Ektachrome, and then there were some Digital 8 too. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Some of the night vision shots I'm figuring are, are digital yeah. when you're in the theater, when you're seeing Star Wars and uh, the ET yeah, adventure. That, you, you know, I was. I remember I was. I was originally hoping to avoid the, the digital stuff, but. I kept running out of, I would bring in, we would go into these amusement parks, and I would bring in a bag full of film, and I would always run out. I mean, I was just shooting so much, and I would run out, and then I had my digital camera, and there was plenty of digital eight tapes, so I, you know, when we were there, and we were, you know, getting good stuff, and then the actors in wardrobe, so I just started shooting in digital, and I could put the, the digital eight camera on the steady cam so I could get more interesting shots. Like, it seemed that I couldn't do that with the, the film cameras I had at that time. I, so, I, um... And the and the ET adventure, I remember going in there a number of times and testing out high speed film with high speed lenses, and nothing. Uh, it was too grainy. I just couldn't pick up anything, so I had to ultimately shoot that with a night vision. Right. Uh, yeah. Were you were you bringing extras into the amusement parks and then dressing up and like putting on the wigs on yeah. them, or were you just paying people that you found there? <laughs> No, it was uh, people I was I was bringing in. I was paying all their admissions, bringing them in. And we went back multiple times to get stuff. I think there was one case where we recruited a guy at Magic Mountain, uh, the scene on the, the Schindler's List ride where you see the uh, Nazi officer escorting people on and off the yeah. ride uh, off Schindler's List. Uh, that was a, a situation where I just went, we just went in that time. I was getting pickups, and I brought in a Nazi, like a German uniform, and we thought we'd just, I was with my friend Chad, he he was helping out, Chad Nelson, he was helping out a lot on that production, and uh, yeah, we found a guy uh, that that, that agreed to do it, and I paid him cash, and the guy was was actually a military guy, too, so... Ah. uh, it was like one of the only white. It was one of the only white people. <laughs> yeah. Um, oddly enough, uh, but um, did you get into trouble yeah. at all at Universal Studios, or did you have connections from working there? Yeah, ultimately I did. They threw me out of there after like the third or fourth time. They, um, yeah, they they like swarmed. I, mean, I was there by myself, and they. Uh, I was I was getting some last minute. You know, I had, had all the footage I needed. I just needed some backgrounds and some plates of, like, the Waterworld Adventure or something like that. Mm-hmm. And I was shooting cutaways of crowds. And I had the 16-millimeter camera with me, and they, they all they swarmed on me. It was the sheriff's department and everything. Because the sheriff's department is up there on, is actually is actually based up at Universal uh, City Walk. Um, so uh, they have nothing better to do, you know. They send the whole like force on you. you know? Yeah, <laughs> something's going down. They, they're, 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 um, but uh, yeah, they were like uh, they were um, interrogating me for a while. What are you? What are you doing? We've been watching you. We've been watching you on camera. We've seen you here before. What is this for? They were so curious about what the hell I was doing. Like, what is this for? You know, is this? Why are you shooting children? Yeah, that sort of thing. And. Um, 
eventually they yeah they just they just uh let, i was just i was just concerned about them taking the the camera and the film that's all i cared about I, right. I just wanted to take that camera and film with me uh the film especially i didn't care about you know if they arrested me or whatever i would have gotten um you know bailed out but i just wanted that film um but uh yeah so they didn't i got out of there and and the they said, uh, you know, I was uh, technically, this was in 2001. I, I'm sure it didn't stick on the books or anything. And I think I came back there later at some point. Uh, but they said, you know, well, all right, you've been banned or something like that. You're on a list now. <laughs> yeah. So, um, luckily, so you, luckily you were in your bundle, so maybe they won't recognize you if you, if you want to come yeah, back. Yeah, they were standing around, for, I remember, for a long time, trying to figure out what the hell to do with me. Like, they were just talking, like, what are we going to do without me you know, um, privy to what they were talking about. Like they were just discussing, what are we going to do with this guy? What, are we, what can we legally do? What can we legally, can we, can we detain him? They probably could ne- now they could probably just, you know, throw me in Guantanamo Bay or something. Probably. But yeah. This is, uh, <laughs> Still before September 11th, they, they, they yeah. had to let you go. Yeah. Do you have, exactly. Is that your, is that your only trouble you've had with the police? Cause I, I'm guessing you never get, you know, film, you know, shooting permits or anything for all oh, your street no, I footage. Mean, um, I mean, you know, for years, my whole life, since starting making movies, I mean, anyone who makes independent films and guerrilla, guerrilla shooting, you're going to get thrown off locations left and right. So it happens in every everything. Uh, mm-hmm. If you're stealing locations, if you're, you, you, it's going to happen. Um, mostly just issues with security or um, uh, you know someone uh, coming out and telling you to stop or, or right. whatever. It's usually not a police issue, but uh, um, well, some yeah, of the I mean, extras. Oh no! Go ahead. No, I just I just remember getting thrown off a lot of locations on reflections. It was a it became like a, a big nuisance, um, and uh, I would just keep going back. And I had to. It was I was really fortunate that some of the actors were, were sort of um, you know were putting up with this because that's your that's all your main concern is you you know uh, you don't want to lose your actors. But uh, but I was paying them. I mean, I had a budget on that one. So right are all the so, uh, are all the crazies ex are th- those all um, actors? All the crazy people, or did you find some real footage of crazy people on the streets of L.A.? That was a combination. Uh, that was a little easier to recruit people on the spot because there are homeless people all over downtown, and they'll you know you can pay them twenty dollars or forty dollars, and they'll do anything for you uh-huh. um, if you're you know if you're um, you know, uh, fearless about it, and <laughs> yeah. just, just going down there, and, and uh, um, so yeah, it was a combination. I brought some people down there and recruited some homeless people, and, and found some really good, some really good homeless people that were that were great. Well, they're ama- all the 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 people fighting in that movie, all the a- angry homeless people are, are just amazing in that film. And it's almost impossible to tell, you know, which ones are actors and which ones are real street crazies. But yeah. Have you? Did anybody ever like really get get in your face or confront you? You know, I, I heard a woman in the background yell like, "I'll you you got me on video. I'll sue you." I'm pretty sure I heard that. <laughs> well, that was that was dubbed later. That was oh, okay. that, that was in the dubbing process. So. Okay. <laughs> 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 yeah. Um, no. Uh, no. Nothing like that. Um, actually, what? It, what yeah. No. It, no people. The actors and the, the people. And, no. That well, that all went great. You know, they loved it. Um, and uh yeah no that one all that all went smoothly and that that whole dog sequence that we shot in eagle rock um that went amazingly well i remember i was for that scene i was only planning on having i just wanted some barking dogs uh-huh. you know to pop out in the back i didn't i didn't plan on using the people in the scene but then i ended up just using everyone in the sequence and you know expanding it so like a neighborhood watch or something out with their crazy dogs looking for this this watch peddler. What did, what did you do? Did you rub meat on yourself or something? How did you get all those dogs to? No, uh, to... Uh, you know, well that was a, that was kind of a remarkable thing where the, the dogs just cooperated for the camera, um, and uh, I mean they they really knew when the uh, you know when, when the camera was on and off because they <laughs> they 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 acted on cue perfectly. Uh, they all started barking and and attacking and. As soon as the camera was off, they were wagging their tails. I was petting the dogs. Um, yeah, it was pretty amazing. That is amazing. The, the, the was, dogs were, were professionals. I, saw, I was watching with my friends. I was like, how do you get the dog to do that? And my friends like, those are Hollywood dogs for sure. <laughs> no, they weren't. They were just people that showed just that ads on Craigslist. Wow. Craigslist ads. Or, the, or maybe were the recycler. I, you know, at the time, the recycler was a, a good way of advertising, too. Nobody uses that anymore. I've never even I heard of that. I don't even know that. if that's around anymore. Right. It's, it's an L.A. publication. Um 
that's um I don't even know if it's still uh, around, but um yeah. Yeah, just uh yeah, Craigslist and free ads, you know. Yeah, so uh, I mean, there's so many people on that on that film, and you watch something, you think, oh, he's he's actually sneaking into a, like a, a mo- th- like the sound the sound guys, the young Spielberg sequence. Are those real sound guys, or are those just actors? Um, those were all actors. The uh, uh, for that scene, um, they were like uh, a lot of them were a crew that worked together, and uh, they were actually the funny thing is they were actually working on a real Spielberg film around the same time, I think at the same time, uh, that same week, we are shooting <laughs> that scene. They were working on, um, I believe it was AI. They were doing background in AI. How did you meet these, and, these um, Spielberg uh, employees? I mean, production team. How, uh, the, how, did, how did you the, meet them? That's, uh, that's amazing. Like, you're, you're, they're filming Spielberg, and then you get them to, f- yeah, to shoot the well, sequence with the fake Spielberg. Yeah. Yeah, they, they went from the real spill to the fake spill. That was just a coincidence. I found those. I think I found them. I was doing. I was getting a lot of help from. Uh, there was a casting agency in Hollywood called Prime Casting, and and uh, the guy there was letting me come in and go through all the books for free and and uh, pick out anyone. Um, and I found some of those people um, through that through that method. And, and uh, there were for a couple of old. You know, I was looking for old crew guys, union crew guys, and. Uh, some of them knew uh, other people, and there was a group of them that all worked together. Um, and um, so a lot of that came about through that and other people thrown in. I remember I was trying to, you know, um, I was trying to get a few name actors in this, in cameos or small bit parts <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> originally. And just, to, you know, just to throwing out the, um, the inquiry to see if it was possible. And I remember trying to get... Um, Angus Scrim as a as an old crew guy at one point. That would be amazing. Uh, and it was a remote chance, but yeah. I just figured, what the hell? And um, who was the other actor? The other guy uh, who um, I'll think of him in a second. Uh, he's um, uh, um, uh, Jeff Corey. I don't know if you know. He's no, a I don't know who that actor. is. He was uh, he was in um, oh god, like hundreds of films. Uh, True Grit, the original, and uh, mm-hmm. you would you would know him if you saw him. He was probably one of those westerns faces. and. Um, the funny thing is, I, I I had forgotten at the time, but he was um, he was mostly an actor, but he did direct some some TV in the seventies, and he had directed some Night Gallery episodes oh. uh, in the uh, in the early seventies, which, which was which was funny because you know he uh, pointed that out when he was contacted. You know, I directed uh, <laughs> because it was because the scene was uh, or the movie at the time. I think the whole thing at the time I was calling it Night Gallery Revisited. Oh, that was the uh, original of title of okay. Yeah, yeah, but it was a working title. I don't think I was planning on using that. It was just the working title I was using. Did, did you have a script uh, for the movie written up? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was a script. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it was more of a. Yeah, it was more of a. Uh, I think it was more of like a detailed treatment. Mm-hmm. But, and there was a lot of open ends. There was a lot of areas open for improvisation. You know, it grew. Uh, I, I, I remember, well, I remember the original draft of it. It had the, had the Spielberg flashbacks and the, and the watch selling. And the, you know, a lot of that is open ended. It's, it's open for expansion, uh, endless expansion because you, you can't really describe. You no, know, we would just go out there and see what we could get. Um, and I would just describe the you know, all the rage scenes, for example, the hostility and the anger and yeah. confrontations, and all that. You know, there are a million different situations you could film for that. And, um, and the dogs and the helicopters and, um, but that was all, yeah, I mean, the, yeah, the, the watch peddling and the, this trapped in this endless circle where the main character couldn't, um, sort of get out of the situation where he was breaking even with his watches and he'd have to go back on the streets and he would just break even and he's like trapped in his purgatory. That was in the, the original draft and, I had some other idea about like all the collective anger and hostility that was accumulating in this train tunnel up in Chatsworth Park, um, but uh, I, I don't remember what that was, what that meant. And then I mean, it was, was I guess it was just in the air then, and then nine eleven happens, and it just you know explodes, yeah. kind of you know the whole the whole paranoia. You know, it's you you caught on to that right at the moment it was happening. It seems like you're on the same wavelength. Yeah, 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 yeah definitely, yeah, yeah. Did you you rented? I yeah, guess you. I mean, it's, no, go ahead. 
No, I was just, you know, it's, I just think it's like the same vibe that, that kind of, you know, that, started, that came out of the late 80s and early 90s, really. Uh, things hadn't changed at all. Because this, this, uh, I think of that period, late 80s, early 90s, as like the, the uh, closing down period, the fear, paranoia, punishment, war on drugs. Um, you know, there, were, there was the Rodney King thing, of course, but I mean... You know, con- con- contrasted with the seventies into the early eighties, which were looser and freer and less restrictions, less rules, a lot of um, creative risks, and um, you know, suddenly in the late eighties, um, it was like a, you know, it was the time of like uh, putting an end to all that, you know. Yeah, I, I love the contrast in the film between, you know, you got, you're going for the 70s vibe the whole time. There's the 70s flashback sequences and that 70s vibe, and then you have the really modern anger and paranoia, you know, contra- contrasted with, with it. It's, it's pretty cool. Just uh, pretty yeah, original. It's yeah, kinda ta- was, it gives a, a, timeless, a timeless feel to me with the two, the two different uh, time periods intersecting like that. Yeah, and that was part of the idea. The dreamy, uh, yeah, early seventies contrast with the chaos and the noise, cacophony of the present. Yeah, well, I think you captured the the seventies real well. I mean, all the all the vintage cars going around always in the background. There's not uh, people on there. There's not a lot of modern references in the movie. Not people on their cell phones or, uh, you know, it'd be pretty hard to do today without without getting that. But you've captured you right. captured the the vibe, all the 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 sequences with everybody in wigs. You know, it looks like something out of those commercials I used to see in the nineties. Like, oh, the super sounds of the seventies. You know, like flashback. You know, albums. You know, you'd have those like people in the hip, the hippie outfits running through fields while they played all the. You know, to come on channel fifty five. These uh, these commercials uh-huh. for the the soundtracks. But um, that's it, some of the sequences <laughs> remind me of that with the, the people in costumes, the the hippies. It, you did a really good job uh, with the seventies, and I'm really amazed by that uh, that cop sequence. How you had the budget for that? You had a police car, and you're driving around. Uh, yeah. The, the streets of LA, and I don't know if you actually drove the cop car to Universal, but you made it look like it anyway. <laughs> well, that was uh, yeah, no, that was all like uh, you know mixing and matching. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, I mean, well, I had, yeah, rented a the late '80s police car actually, um, and you know we we had that out in Valencia for a day, and then uh, and all the matching shots were uh, in a um, oh I forgot the kind of car the type of police car that uh, I always forget the make and model but mm-hmm. I found someone who had one of those and used that for the interior of uh, the Bob character driving to Universal and running into the yeah yeah and you had uh, I, he wasn't in this version but Sage Stallone's in the other the other version um, the shorter the shorter I didn't I didn't notice him in the long cut but I remember Sage Stallone being in the the shorter version that he so well, he gets credit for it but so, he's not Really in it? Um, he gets uh, I'm trying to think of what the heck. I, I think there was a maybe a. The only thing that I use, you know, I, I threw in like a um, for um, well, one of the sequences that bridges the present to the early '70s. You know, where the where we cut back to the old people watching old TV programs, which was like a bridge to um, to. Um, cut back to the early 70s i think i used some different a different set of clips or something for that and one of those was Sage Sloan uh uh something like um uh it was like a fake trailer for him yeah. and uh something i forgot what but uh from like uh uh burt reynolds show or something that was it but that's it you know it's like he's in it for like two seconds and some, yeah, some yeah. clips that he's, he's not actually in the uh yeah, but you were you're friends with him. I mean, you were you were friends with yeah. him, right? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. I was hanging out with him for yeah, number of years. Yeah, like uh, right around the time that I just finished it, uh, 2002, 2003. Yeah, I, I remember yeah, the adventures with Sage. Yeah, yeah. I remember reading like Sylvester would always come home and the, the Sage would like pop a, a copy of Reflections Evil on this DVD player, and whenever Sylvester was trying to watch a movie, it would be Reflections yeah. of Evil again, and he'd get all pissed well, off. And, <laughs> <laughs> well, Sage kept sneaking DVDs back into his collection. Uh, he hated, you know, he watched the first five minutes and turned it off in his big, huge, uh, like, private screening room or something. So, Sylvester and, um, did? Yeah. Yeah, 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 Sylvester. And um, and every time Sage would visit him, he would, he, you know, he threw it away, like, originally. And he would put it back in his, his DVD collection and, and 
And like he would point it out to him, oh, yeah, here's that movie again. Like that. <laughs> I thought I threw that thing away. <laughs> No, you just drive them nuts with it. The- that's uh, that's that's pretty awesome. I, I I remember you used to have a website online where you had different celebrity reactions. I don't know if that's still online, but uh, I remember after I first saw the movie, I looked it up, and you had distributed reflections, I guess, all over LA, like twenty five thousand copies, and leaving them in newspaper stacks. And you, yeah. you had gotten gotten them to certain celebrities through, I guess, through contacts you had with them. And so uh, you had a, you had a few celebrity fans, right? Like uh, Ian Anderson. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, a few like random musicians here and there. Yeah, uh, yeah, Ian Anderson, Jethro Tull, really yeah. liked it, and uh, Sammy Hagar. Oddly enough, wow, uh, I'm not, even, I'm not even a big Sammy Hagar fan. It was very random. Um, uh, <laughs> yeah, Sammy Hagar. <laughs> yeah, and um, who else? Is there anyone else? Uh, very few. Henry uh, Henry Ro- or song. Henry Rollins? Oh yeah, right? Henry Rollins. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He liked. It. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I wish I wish that website was still. It had some funny probably reactions. Probably wouldn't even remember it now. But yeah, 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 yeah. I'm sure he sees a lot of stuff. But but it's a, it's an interesting way. I remember, you know, I've talked to people who were in LA around that time, and they they had seen you know copies of like, oh, I've heard of that movie. I, there's there used to be copies around early, you know, 2003. <laughs> there was just anywhere you'd go, you'd go to pick up pick up the LA Weekly, and there'd be a copy of Reflections <laughs> of Evil hidden in there. I don't know if it's a, a market marketing strategy that worked, but. Uh, I, I don't know. I think it it's in, it, no. I think you need people. I think you need a team of people all over the United States doing that. I think you should try again. Just burn. Yeah. You know, spend the rest of your money burning <laughs> another five hundred thousand copies was, and get fun, get somebody um, in each state to to bomb people with it. Yeah, it was it was a fun process, you know, leaving them all over the place, and driving around, and uh, yeah, like dropping them off like like uh, you know like I was delivering uh, uh, magazines or newspapers or something, putting them near. Uh, uh, you know, newspaper machines and things like that. But yeah, it was most. I mean, really, it was just kind of. It was just a waste of of money. But uh, but still, I just. It was such a. I, I don't know. There was just something so fun about it. Uh, Did and it? I wasn't working on anything else, so. Right, and it sounds like sounds like an event, better marketing venture than trying to you know pay money to get film festivals to watch your movie or whatever. Uh. Yeah, well, that was it. Yeah, and that was, that's the other. Really, there was nothing else I could do with it. Uh, you know, I'd sent it to all the festivals, and, and uh, you, there's really nothing you can do with with, a, with an independent film once you're, especially if it has little chance of, uh, of distribution. Um, you know, there's so many issues. I mean, there were so many things with that. You know, the com- just copyright issues with that. I, I never thought it would would, and it, which is still probably the case. Um, I'd send it to a lot of uh, places, but, uh, you know, it's just, uh, you're lucky to get anyone to take a look at something. And, uh, so, I mean, you just, yeah, there's nothing really you can do with, with it in, with the, with an independent film once you finish it. I thought maybe you should maybe you should tour around the country with. I think there's an audience, you know, waiting to see every every most everyone I've shown it to has been, you know, hooked into it. I mean, a few people, you know, definitely aren't. It's a it's a pretty extreme movie, but I've shown it to a lot of people, and I, I think there's an audience out there for it. I'd I'd love to see it in theaters. I thought maybe you could do a anniversary edition and, and go around the country screening it or something. I guess you got you you're busy with other other projects, making new films and stuff. Too busy to. Uh, to screen it, but well, no, I'm not too busy. I'm not doing anything, but that that would take some backing and some, yeah, some, okay, somebody yeah. behind that. I mean, that, that would be an expensive, uh, yeah, advertising and travel and everything. Yeah. Right, right. So, um, so what are you working on now? You showed, you sent me a rough cut of a movie called John Carpenter's Corpse, and that was uh, about yeah. twenty twenty two minutes long. Is that going to be expanded into a feature length film? Oh no, that's or it. That's and the, the version you saw is basically finished. I sent you the version with different music, but it's it's. Ninety-nine percent finished. I mean, it's it's done now. It's been finished for a long time. Yeah, but um, I, I'm just calling it a rough cut. Uh, no, it's you know, it's a, it's actually surprising. I ended up that long. That's for an anthology or a uh, uh, like a compilation of uh, you know, uh, omnibus film of shorts that is uh, coming out soon uh, called uh, Betamax. Okay, it's going to be like that. And, v, uh, that v, those VHS movies that are being released right, now, those horror yeah. films. We're going to do one with Beta yeah. Max now. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah, you know, oh God, I mean, everyone's doing one of those now. Yeah, it's not just yeah. the VHS movies; it's just they're just all over the place. Like, I mean, because they're cheap, and um, you know, you can get other filmmakers to do things for no money or for free, and and uh, it's just the only affordable way of uh, of putting together a feature is putting together an, an omnibus film now. Right. Since um, yeah, you just you know you just get other people to. Uh, 
put things together uh, either with their own money or um, with a tiny bit of money behind it. Do, do you still uh, find um, L.A. to be a, you know, an aspiring place to film? I mean, the locations in, in Reflections are, are amazing, all the backgrounds and the billboards. I mean, you captured... I moved out to L.A. when I was 19. I spent a few months there you know, before I saw the movie, but it, you captured it so well. The, there's, every time I'd go up for a run or something, there's barking dogs jumping out at me, and the mm-hmm. first day on the bus, I saw somebody get uh, punched in the face and thrown off the bus just by another passenger, and they just... You know, I mean, mm-hmm. you, really, you really captured it well. Do you still find, uh, you still find L.A. to be a, a great place to film? Well, um, yeah, uh, you know, it's, it's more, it's, I don't know, it, it seems like it's, uh, it's just the way reality is changing, uh, the further we get into the future, but there, it just seems like there are less and less more interesting places, photogenic places to film because of the way, um, you know, the mini malls and the businesses and the design of everything now is so bland, it's so lacking of any character. Yeah, architecture, uh, signage, uh, everything, colors. I don't. It, it's just. It's. I don't find any of it. Uh, films set in the in the modern age and the you know in the the present are just dull. Um, you know. Uh, Purely based on the time they're sent in, uh, to some extent. <laughs> well, yeah, it's, and, it's everything looks like. I mean, digital stuff. It looks all kind of the same, and everything's really ironic now. And everything's been done, so everything's just a reference to something else. It's, I, I don't. I don't watch many yeah. movies that come out nowadays. I just. I'm still digging through the '70s and early '80s. Uh, yeah, we're con- we're just cannibalizing everything. There's nothing left. It's like hit a wall, and everything's just cannibalizing something else that's been done. It's a carbon copy. It's endless variation. Which, yeah. um, which is why of, I think more uh, people more people need to see Reflections of Evil because you're taking stuff from the past. But I thought you were that's one of the only movies in the 21st century where you're like pushing ahead, not just not just referencing the past, but referencing the past and pushing it into somewhere new. And I think more people need to see that movie because I mean just the timeless quality of it, the, the way it's not it, it could have come out like any time. I mean it's too very 2001 with the with the yeah. uh, September 11th stuff. But I mean, but it, it's also which very is, timeless. Which, is, uh, which there's basically, I mean, there is absolutely, what major differences can you point out from 2001 to, to we're, on, we're in 2015 now? Like it's, we're, it's identical, the period, pretty much. Pretty much, just ug- a little not, bit uglier every year, just a l- yeah. little bit more, everything just more, looks more the same, more... Uh, more mini malls, more, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, really, can you point out major differences that have that have taken place in the last you know, 15 years uh, just more heads down on their cell phones on the bus you know nobody nobody looks guess, at each uh, other anymore right, exactly. just... yeah the, the, the smartphones and everything. Mm-hmm. I mean that was never I remember thinking at that time I'm surprised something like smartphones weren't implemented into the um, uh, into the marketplace then because I'm, I'm sure that the technology is around it just takes so many years for these things to be uh, to, to saturate and implement into the into the marketplace but I know that yeah, I mean, because we had cell phones then, they just weren't up to the point where it was, uh, it was a little port- portable computer you were carrying around with portable internet. But I always, you know, I knew that was coming. And I think maybe even the very beginnings of it were around, but uh, um, it just it just took, a, you know, an extra 10 years for that. So, so do you see any hope in the future for, for filmmaking or for the world in general? You, could there be a revival? Could there be? Could I guess maybe things would have to collapse first? The film industry would have to collapse, and we'd have to start, you know, from the scraps or something. I don't. I don't know how how we could make yeah. it like it was in the early seventies or something when it was just you know good film after good film. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, that's probably not. I, <laughs> no, probably I don't, not. Yeah, it's uh, it's hard to say. I, I don't know. It's just that's, uh, that's an impossible question. I, I'm not, um, I'm not uh, blindly optimistic like some people are. Um, you know, I really don't know. Um, Do you find it easier? I feel less inspired. Less inspired. Do you find it easier to film now, or is it, or is it less now that everybody can film and you have, you can cut on, you can shoot on digital and put it right in and and have you know shoot the movie and have it come out in a couple of weeks. You know, uh, is that yeah. is that better or, or or worse than the the grunt work you used to have to do to make a no, movie? No, it's, it's well, you know, I mean, it's a double edged. I I I think it's a lot worse. Uh, you know, it, it's way oversaturated now, and there's just no point. Everything's lost its value. There's every you're just you're just you're making you're creating 
these things, you know, for yourself and for a circle of friends around you, and mm-hmm. and the things that get you know noticed or I don't I, you know it's stuff that goes viral or whatever. It's just um, uh, I don't even know why or how it, it does, but uh, it, yeah, it's just too much stuff out there, and, and it's. Um, Nothing matters, and you know it's, no, it, it, it doesn't mean anything. It's a reason, like um, I have to restrict myself to time periods when I'm looking for music or music or movies. You know, when I'm looking for stuff to play on the radio or or just to watch, I have to restrict myself because I mean, I'm sure there's a few good movies coming out nowadays, but I'll, but they're how are you going to find them? You have to dig through, you know, you know, find the needle in the haystack. I guess you yeah. have to dig through so much garbage, and yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, at the same time, though, I kind of embrace technology in a, in a lot of ways. I mean, I, well, I do really like, uh, you know, the, the digital uh, film, uh, editing age. I mean, Final Cut Pro and, and um, I just can't imagine going back to, to, you know, splicing film and dubbing through more complicated methods. I mean, it, was so, it was just so difficult to, if you had no money, uh, to, uh, you know, to get a film finished and to, to mix it the way you want. And, and uh, I mean, I, I I love, uh, you know, desktop editing and, um, you know, mixed feelings about, about, uh, about digital cameras and, and um, the digital format in general. I don't know if that really is, is such a major issue, though. Uh, you know, just the, 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 the aesthetics of, um, you know, of um, comparing formats, film, and especially now since everything is, is a transferred, projected, scan, cut, timed. It's all, you know, if you shoot on film now, there's hardly much of a point in that unless you're actually going through the whole process. You're timing, you're making prints from a negative, just the way you did in the old days. You know, there's almost, this kind of seems pointless to uh, to shoot on film if you're doing everything else digitally. Um, you know, if you're scanning it, cutting it, mixing it, timing it, um, having a digital negative made, and then, and then, Projecting it, you know, they're just yeah. a, it's like a, you know, all you're just you're doing is you're just creating a uh, there's a slight there's a subtle difference in uh, in film and, and digital, and I did yeah, film definitely I think looks better um, uh. aesthetically, the colors and the um, you know they're, they're, it does look better, but you're still you're looking at a digital um, facsimile of film. You're not really actually looking unless you're actually seeing. I mean, I think like for example, Interstellar right now. I mean, that was pretty much. At least the prints that are being shown. Um, I mean, I, I'm not 100 percent certain about this, but I think that was pretty much done, you know, with the whole process the way it it, it should be done with uh, with uh, color, you know, the timing and the prints made. But I'm not 100 percent sure about that. But, um, Let's see. We only got a, we only got um, a couple minutes left. I was just going to ask you if there's any filmmakers, any contemporary filmmakers you really like, uh, who are releasing movies now. Oh, uh, yeah, I'm sure, uh, you think here, well, contemporary as in, uh... I guess uh, anybody in the last, you know, ten years coming out with stuff that's inspiring to you or uh, that you think could be the the way to go or, you know, doing doing stuff you think is actually original or interesting... Hmm. Because I, 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 I'm a big fan. Yeah. I know there are some. When, I, when people I, ask me, I, I say Damon Packard. You know, and like, who's doing something original now? Like, oh, Damon Packard comes to mind. But I'm, I'm looking for more. You know, more people who are <laughs> kind of on oh, a, a similar way. Out there, I just, I just not. Uh, you know, there's still some older. You know, I mean, I still like what Terrence Malick does on, on uh, from time to time. Yeah. Uh, I like. Um, I like uh, the filmmaker um, made um, Koyana Scotchi and Samsara. I like. I oh like yeah, the, the Italian guy. I don't remember his name. Uh, uh, Ron, no, he's he's, he's American. Ron Fricky. Oh okay. Koyana uh, Scotch. Uh, Koyana Scotch. Well, actually, no. Koyana Scotchi was directed by um, the other guy. Uh, I forget yeah. his name. Godfrey Godfrey Reggio. Uh, but it was shot by Fricky. Oh yeah. And then he, he made some. Like, Samsara like was do. Samsara was really good. Yeah, I got to see that in the yeah. theater. That was that was good. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm sure there are. I can't think of any like new, young, emerging filmmakers uh, offhand. Uh, but I probably am just not. I'm sure I've seen some things that that I like. Uh, 
just not I'm just not thinking of anything offhand. <laughs> I'd have to think about that. I'd have to put that to some thought. I know that people will uh you know, chime in with a lot of uh you know a lot of suggestions on that. There sure. there are uh, there's a lot of people out there off the radar that are doing interesting things. Definitely. And uh, and I hope I hope this interview got more people on your radar because I think on well, Thanksgiving's coming up. Instead of watching a football game, I think families around America should be watching Reflections of Evil. I think that would be a better, you know, more inspiring kind of day <laughs> to share with your family. I appreciate you coming on. Uh, the time went by really fast. I wanted to open it up to to take callers on the air, but our time's up and the next DJ's standing outside. Mm. So if you uh, if you ever want to come back on the show, uh, we can we can talk about some of your other work about Fox Fur and uh, and other stuff. The the uh, invitation's yeah, sure. open yeah. if you want to come back and we can i know you have a lot of fans out there in cleveland who wanted to uh, talk to you so i i'm sorry i didn't have time to do um to take callers on the air but uh but i really appreciate oh, no, you no um waking up so early it's you know 8 a.m now out there and uh, i appreciate you getting up super early to do this interview oh i've been up for a while actually no it's not a problem i'm, I'm usually up at this time i'm on all sorts of crazy changing schedules so yeah it's not a problem Right, yeah, I see you on the internet and you're posting stuff, you know, on Facebook and stuff late, you know, at all hours. You, it seems like you're not much of a sleeper. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I just sleep at weird times. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah no, that'd be great. Thanks. Thank yeah, you. no, thanks yeah, for coming great. out, and I'll, I'll, you know, send you the interview. It'll be available for streaming on on our archives for the, the coming week, and you can download it, and I'll send you an MP3 of the interview and stuff. So, yeah, I appreciate it. Okay, have a have a have a good day out there in the Sunshine State. Thanks a lot. All right, thanks. Bye. But, but, see.